Our next speaker is Donald Jones, Vice President of Business Development with Qualcomm. And his focus today is going to be on the power of wireless medical devices, their applications and services. Everyone is on the net. <laughs> well, thanks to uh, Larry to uh, inviting me. I'm not sure he knew what he was doing when he invited me because he invited a lawyer uh, to speak to you. But that wasn't his worst mistake. I, uh, when I was in undergrad doing bioengineering, I was signed up to take a molecular biology class and walked in the first day and realized I had no clue what they were talking about. So I immediately ran to the dean's office and convinced the dean that abnormal psychology would be a really good substitute for molecular biology and got, and got away with it. <laughs> so you might really be wondering what, what's a wireless guy doing in a, uh, in a conference like this. And, and uh, I spend my time working with uh, medical device companies and pharmaceutical companies working on bringing connectivity into healthcare and, uh, and, and specifically wireless connectivity. So we're actually not a life science company but we're actually a, a wireless uh, technology company that works specifically in, as one of our verticals in the, in the healthcare field. So today I'm gonna walk you through what's happening in the world of wireless health. But in order to set the stage here, I'm gonna walk you through a, a little bit of background about our, our industry and in the, in the wireless industry. Today we have about four and a half million cell phone users in the world. And that as it compares to other forms of con consumer electronics like TVs and PCs, is significantly ahead of that. We will finish this year with well over five billion cell phone users in the world and probably close to five and a half billion. That's out of six and a half billion people. So the notion here, or the opportunity here that we like to say is, this is a technology that's more pervasive than almost anything else you can think. There are more cell phone users today in the world than there are toothbrush users. The network extends to, to more people in the world, more people have access to the network than they do to running water or to electricity. And that's really the powerful notion that's, that we're advancing in the healthcare world is that the power of the network, the access of being able to essentially create, put, put, put nodes on the network that, but where those nodes may be any kind of variety of sensors, medical devices, therapeutic uh, interventions of a variety of type, they can take advantage of this network to create connected solutions which help save time and help save money. And so if we take these resources and then begin to apply them into, into healthcare, we all know what the problems are. We know what the sizes of the problems are, and they're quite large. They're very expensive. They're dominant in various forms through different populations. The issues in the first world countries versus third world countries vary, but there's still very interesting issues in, in, in all of them. So we start looking at the targets. And this particular list of targets was put together by Eric Topol, together with myself with, with the West Wireless Health Institute. And these are some of the solutions that can take advantage of wireless technologies in order to make things happen faster. And that's really where we see the ROI in applying wireless technologies in healthcare. The ROI comes from making things hap happen faster than they would otherwise happen because there's connectivity. We call it collapsing time and space. So if you look at the examples here, these are some of the top targets that we identified and we, as, a, as a, one of the original board members of the West Wireless Health Institute, these were the targets we, we assigned, uh, assigned to the institute and with some of the applications that we put on it. I'll talk a little bit more about the Institute here in a minute. So what do I do day in and day out? And what does our industry do day in and out in, in our vertical of applying wireless? Well, predominantly we work, we work with sensors. And we work with sensors that are in the body, as in implants, on the body, around the body, and environmental. And we work in combinations of sensors. And I'll show you some examples. But the sensor side of things is one of the large areas, not the only area, but one of the large areas that's coming into the cell phone world. And frankly, in many ways, in some, several good examples is already here. How, how many here are users of the Nike Plus system? It looks like about five, maybe 10%. That's the accelerometer that goes in your shoe. And that's a wireless device that'll communicate here of different 
uses of wireless in different venues for different, uh, for different value propositions. And this so far is the list that we've identified that can take advantage of wireless or are already taking advantage of wireless in the healthcare field. So when we look at wireless in healthcare, we're looking at consumer models, fitness models, professional healthcare models, hospital models, and just about every other, and, and healthcare infrastructure models, public health models as well. And, and that's what's represented here. So at the end of the day, if you think about wireless health and this label of wireless health, what we're really saying, the thing to think about in the back of your mind is what opportunities can be achieved if what I'm doing can be done in a connected way versus what happens if it's not connected. In the world of these wearable sensors that I just talked about, this is the projection for, for the, uh, from ABI, but it's actually been now validated by a number of other, other folks, for body-worn sensors over the next four and a half years. So the orange line is fitness and consumer sensors. That's where the Nike Plus system sits. The purple line is the hospital sensors. Very, very interesting area. We are going to absolutely see in a relatively very short period of time the, the evolution of vital sign acquisition by sensors, meaning when you get to the hospital, you'll be asked to lift your shirt, they'll slap some band-aids on, and the nurse coming around to take your temperature, take your heart rate, watch your chest rise and fall, take your blood pressure, will no longer happen. It'll all be happening continuously off these band-aids. The band-aids, if you think this is futuristic, the band-aids are here now. Many of them, are, some are already approved. Many of them are advanced stages of clinical approval and many of them will actually launch commercially in large stages uh, uh, at the end, towards the end of this year and into next year. And not just by small companies, many of these are coming by very large companies. The disappointing line is the home line, and that's the market. That's the, the market that a lot of folks are writing about, is how to, how to monitor people at home. But I'd like to offer that as the acceptance comes through in the hospital line, where the medical professionals will pick up and, and begin to trust them, it'll become very easy to send people home with, uh, with wireless sensors. And that will cause the, uh, the green line to rise, uh, to rise with it. Pretty big market estimates for just, again, we're just looking here at the wearable sensor side of things. So we're looking at pretty big market sizes in terms of sales of sensors. Obviously, the blue, the blue circle here is the more interesting one. That's the potential savings that's being estimated by being able to remotely monitor folks. When we talk about these Band-Aids and vital sign sensors, and I'm going to show you some examples here shortly, we're not only talking about being able to save labor, the nursing labor of acquiring all those vital signs, we're also talking about the ability to send people home and continue to acquire them and monitor and titrate drugs, et cetera, post their hospitalization. But I actually think it goes one, it's going to go so one step further. We're going to get to the point with the quality of the sensors that we're going to do that you're not going to have to go into the healthcare system all the time. And so think about a future when the call to the physician starts with, ends with, take two Band-Aids and call me in the morning. So let me talk a little bit about what the wireless industry is doing here to build the ecosystem together with the healthcare industry. So historically, there's not been a lot of ties between the two industries. So when I first started in my role, I had to start to look at how to build a liaison between the healthcare industry, life sciences industry, and the wireless industry. And to begin with, I had to get the life science industry thinking about how to use wireless before I could get the wireless industry talking about how to sell their services to the life science industry. So I had an ecosystem out there of operators, manufacturers that make consumer electronics in the wireless industry, webcos, and various media services. And I had to figure out how to overlay on top of that a healthcare group of health service companies, life science companies, med device companies. And make, that and make these two industries relevant to each other. And we've seen lots of convergence in the wireless industry. It's the single largest consumer device, as I've just talked about earlier, in the history of mankind. And we've seen lots and lots of convergence. But convergence happen when two industries both get, when you have people in both industries that understand the other industry and start working to collaborate together. When that happens, you actually start seeing the converged products come together. So five years ago, we put together something called the Wireless Life Science Alliance. And just this week, I actually just came from here, we just had 1,000 people in La Jolla at our annual meeting working specifically on this topic. And there's just some examples of some of, the, some of the partner companies that are involved in 
the application of wireless in, in the healthcare space. And this happens to be an organization that puts on a variety of, uh, of, uh, of, of types of meetings from targeting CEOs, targeting investors, and targeting the, uh, the academic community. This last year, we just opened the West Wireless Health Institute. This is an institute that uh, Eric Topol and I uh, kind of dreamed up on the back of a napkin. And we, what, what we were looking for was a place to combine the clinical expertise with the scientific expertise with the wireless engineering expertise and essentially create that three-legged stool in one place. I only had the wireless part of Qualcomm. We didn't have the other parts. So we, we dreamed up a, an institute for this and found a, a benefactor in the form of the Gary and Mary West Foundation who's publicly announced about $65 million in support for this institute, which is now open. But in fact, you will see shortly over time that the financial support for this institute is dramatically higher than that. Uh, we recruited uh, one of the three vice chairs of J&J &J to run it, Joe Smith from previously CMO of uh, Guidant and, and later in a similar role at J&J uh, &J as chief medical and scientific officer. And this is actually becoming very rapidly a convergence between wireless technologies personalized medicine, genomics, drug therapy, all in a, in a very specific focused uh, uh, research institute. Larry, if you have any postdocs that are interested going on, we have 25 postdoc positions and about 20 of them are left to fill right now, so. <laughs> um, we also have some very interesting standards groups forming and I'll just point out this group. This doesn't show all the companies, but this is a standards group for consumer health products. Now look who's in this group. You have MedDevice, you have Pharma, you have insurers, payers, you have wireless companies, both the carriers and the, and the consumer electronics producers, and you have healthcare providers. Can you think of any other organization in the world that brings those groups together in, in one group? And what are they working on? They're working on standards for consumer health devices. There's 230 companies in this, in this group and they meet all over the world. This is something a lot of the healthcare industry doesn't even know is actually happening kind of in the background. But what does this portend to? It portends to a whole number of products that are cheaper, produced in, vo in much higher volumes than typical, and um, actually can be used by consumers at home. And I'll show you one of the first certified products. So this is a, just a Bluetooth Nonin SpO2 meter. In the hospital, this is three to $6,000. In the consumer at home version, it's about $300. If I bought it in China, it's about $30. <laughs> it's available in China, too, at that. Probably with known in IP, I suspect. But this gets a heart rate SpO2, but in a battery-operated, connectable way where the patient can self-apply. It, it actually has the ability to do some alarms, or you can tie it with their phone number and have them kind of remind them to test when you want them to test. But it also shows the value of kind of bringing, applying some consumer electronics into a much lower price point. Uh, FDA approved device. The M Health Alliance is another group. This is the world's largest foundations getting together and saying, how should we spend our money on mobile health applications? So this was originally put together by the, by the United Nations Foundation, this is Ted Turner's money, if you remember the billion dollars he gave to the United Nations, and joined by the Rockefeller Foundation and the Vodafone Foundation. There's a bit of a dotted line to the Gates Foundation. But essentially the M Health Alliance is beginning to ask the question, how and where should we invest our money in mobile technologies uh, in, to, to benefit the developing world. And you are going to see over the course literally of the next 12 months a number of efforts both funded and a number of RFPs for projects that will offer funding to bring mobile technologies into the, uh, in, especially into the third world uh, arenas. And that doesn't necessarily mean simple kinds of projects. Some of the, some of the most uh, interesting projects we're seeing in the third world are things that are very elaborate, like actually monitoring all the patients in a hospital, running, running an ICU remotely, cloud-based ICU patient monitoring, using cellular connectivity, instead of buying very, very expensive GE Siemens equipment and putting big boxes and having it self-contained in the hospital, using very inexpensive devices and running cloud-based systems to, to run the monitoring system. We're even seeing the cellular industry pick up the wireless talk. This is the uh, Cellular Telephone Industry Association. That's Eric Topol in there giving a presentation on wireless and healthcare. Um, but even more interestingly, at Consumer Electronics Show this year in January, for the very first time in, a, in GE Healthcare's history, a medical device was launched 
not by a GE executive, and not at a healthcare show. It was launched by Eric Topol on stage at the Consumer Electronics Show. It was the GE V-Scan ultrasound, pocketable ultrasound. Gives you a little bit of idea of maybe where GE's thinking long term and why they might have it cause a medical product to launch at a consumer electronics show and not at a medical show. So let me, I'm going to walk you through some examples. We'll go through some different categories, and first in the consumer health area. But I, I'll, I'll point out that what's beginning to happen here, and I'm showing the Nike product here on the, on the left, and uh, some other products around other heart, heart measurement and exercise measurement, we're beginning to see a world where people are learning to kind of live by numbers and feed other kinds of feedback. If you look at the Nike product, there's a lot to be learned in the product because they figured out how to take social networking and blend it in with a product that collects a number, which is essentially how much activity you've had measured in a lot of forces. But they've applied that into a whole lot of peer challenges and social networking challenges. For those that some of you may know that they actually run virtual marathons globally. You can actually be a marathon runner of one against other marathon runners in your town because you're connected on the, on the net, so to speak. But here's the really interesting part that Nike didn't really expect. That Nike now is pushing close, work, close up to 200, 2 million connected users through the Nike Plus product. But what they didn't expect was that the connected Nike customer is their most valuable customer. The revenue per customer that's connected through that, through that one product and all of the social networking has become their most valuable customer out of their entire network. And we're seeing that over and over and over again in other examples that we see in the wireless industry. That, the, that when you start to build, and think about the Apple example. Apple didn't just sell a phone, they sold a system. The iMac was a system and the phone obviously built on it, now the iPad's built on it. Nike's done the same thing. They built a retail system, an information system, a fun system, a way of sharing information, a way of challenging your friends and, uh, and participating in a group method. Think about applying the Nike system. Uh, an example in healthcare is patients like me, where patients are getting together in a social networking to kind of compare their own, their own experiences around a particular disease. If you haven't looked at that site, that's a very interesting one to go. This is a very simple application I'm showing in the consumer space called the pill phone. This does something very simple. It allows people to manage their list of medications on their phone. So when they go to the doctor and the doctor says, what are you taking? It's right there, the whole list is there. It's not on a card or coming out of memory or in the, black, in the paper bag where they've dumped all the medications in. Uh, it allows them to set up reminders so they can have for each medication so that during the day the reminders can, can go off. It allows them to run drug-to-drug -drug interactions. This is, empowers the consumer to do their own drug-to-drug -drug interactions right on their phone. And <clears throat> it's a very inexpensive way of deploying, uh, of, of deploying that technology. The iPhone application just came out uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact. Here's a different version of, of a very simple application on the phone. This one's deployed in India. This is to fight counterfeit drugs, where up to 50% of the drugs are counterfeit in India, where a pharmacist can make a much higher margin, 80% instead of 20, typically, selling a counterfeit product, some, ca some cases intentionally, in some cases without knowing it. What this product does is allow the consumer to buy the product in the pharmacy, get a scratch code on the product, text it to a standardized number, and get an immediate response back on a, uh, from an SMS message to say that product is actually a legitimate pharmaceutical product. Very simple model. It's got a very interesting business model. The, they sell the codes to the pharmacy, to, to the pharmaceutical manufacturer, and they have a revenue share arrangement with the carriers on the SMS texting. We're seeing this model has already commercially now deployed in India and into parts of Africa, where there are similar kinds of problems. Very, very simple. But here's what else it's doing, and this is what's really interesting. It's solving the counterfeit problem, which everybody knows about in these countries. They know there's a problem. But the, other, but the other thing it's doing is giving, it's collecting the phone numbers of the consumer that just bought the, cons the manufacturer's product. The manufacturer, for the first time basically in history, in, one, in, third, in a third world country, they don't even have this in, in the U.S., now has a direct relationship that they can establish between the manufacturer and the consumer. Which means they can do follow-on surveys, they can do marketing, obviously controversial, but you can think about the reality is they've never had that kind of connectivity and the uh, consumers are now participating. Zio is out in the sleep, sleep space. 
This is basically your home EEG for sleep. It's kind of your home sleep lab, and they've created the concept of a sleep score. The concept here is pretty is 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 kind of simple and revolutionary. This is a non-FDA device. There's probably some debate about whether it should be, but they've created this consumer score about sleep, and they're actually training people, just like Nike's training people to, around the fitness side. They're training people around the sleep side. And what's really interesting uh, from uh, from what we're seeing in the past is you see the the uh, devices here, and you you wear this headband, and you you get the score, and and. Um, uh, one of the things you, you'll find out quite quickly if you try this is your, uh, your spouse won't, will know whether you're actually sleeping or faking it, because they can just look at the clock. But, <laughs> but, uh, but the sensor here, the EC, the, we're, we now are seeing uh, EEG sensors that replace the multiple sensors with a single patch that's wireless. So you can, you can imagine quite quickly that this can, go around, this can all go away with a very simple disposable uh, patch-like uh, thing that goes on your forehead. And for sleep labs, for sleep apnea, that'll make a big difference. We, have, uh, we actually have four different ways that we're seeing connected diabetes meters come to the table, which really aren't, that's really not the story. The real story is about enabling and empowering consumers to manage their own health with a much more rich, information-rich environment. So we see Bluetooth meters that talk and communicate with a phone. We see meters that actually have the guts of a phone inside of them, and you will see several of them launched this year in the United States. And you'll see, we see phones that have a meter in the phone. So those are three different ways of addressing connected glucose meters. The fourth way, that's one of the more interesting ones, comes from Dexcom in San Diego, and this is the meter. It's a Band-Aid. It's a continuous meter with a radio. You wear it on your lower abdomen for three days. This transmits to a little handheld device, which today is not yet on the net, but will shortly be on the net. So, but in terms of actually reading your, reading your, reading your uh, glucose level, this is continuous, or at least semi-continuous. Has a little tiny 26 gauge needle in the back. And once you put it on, you forget about it. About half the people don't even feel the needle insertion. It's small enough. So this is a, very, this is a revolutionary way, plus a much safer way of measuring glucose continuously. Obviously pretty unobtrusive. Shower, you can wear it in the shower. And the electronics are all baked in there. The radio itself is reusable. Now think about that in the hospital environment and how important glucose is in the hospital environment. Not yet currently FDA approved for the hospital, but you can imagine how important this could be in a hospital environment, ICU environment, down the road. Pills. You'll see this product launch in, a, in about uh, 60 days for the AT&T. This is a pill bottle, standard pill bottle, with a special cap. Current cost of that cap is about $5. It'll fall very rapidly to about $2. That is a cap that, at least at this point in the time in the business model, pharmaceutical companies are interested in underwriting. That cap has a radio in it. It also has a little LED light, and it's got, some, and it's got a little music maker in it. So that is a bottle of pills that will... Blink at you, say, take me, take me. It'll chirp at you if you don't open the cap and, and take them. So after a little while, it'll chirp at you. If you still don't take them, the network will call your phone and say, hey, you know, the bottle is telling us, telling us <laughs> you're not taking your pills. But that's not the best part in my mind. The best part in my mind, besides the fact you can actually build a social networking, you can let mom, dad, the kids all know what you're, whether you're taking your pills or not. The, be the best part is, is that as you're pouring the last pills out of that bottle and realize that you're going to need some more pills, the reorder button is on the bottom of the cap. That's all you do to reorder is push the button. You've just sent the message in saying, I need some more. And then FedEx or UPS or the mailman can bring, bring you more pills. That pill bottle talks to that nightlight. That's the way it gets to that. That nightlight has an AT&T radio in it. So the instructions, the, imagine the simplicity when mom goes home from the pharmacist with her bottle of pills. Cap's a little different. Got a little light on it and a nightlight. And the directions from the pharmacist are, plug the nightlight in. That's it. That's the system. It's already been set up. So this is an example of a very consumer-friendly product. That nightlight can support up to 12 different bottles. The bottles are color-coded, so you can have different, manage different pills. At a price point where that entire system can go out the door at under $100. And when you look at two things, increased compliance. Right now, the research on this particular product shows about a 23% pickup in compliance. 
Uh, it's really interesting to see maps of entire cities where you have that hundreds and hundreds of users going and seeing what happens with compliance, which you can actually see, see live here. Um, but about a 23% uptake in, in compliance with some additional uptake in renewal of prescriptions, which gives the economic model so that somebody will pay for it and give it to the consumer for free. It's the Kindle model. It's the Amazon Kindle model applied to drugs. It's the Amazon one-touch button right on the pill bottle. And that's an interesting concept that we've been working on with a lot of manufacturers around the idea of, sh should I put wireless connectivity in my device? The first reaction is, is, well, what will I get out of that from a clinical result? How will I improve outcomes? And they're all envisioning seven years worth of trials and papers and publications and twisting of arms. So the notion we've been working on with a number of manufacturers is, why don't you just put a reorder button on your product? and sell more product for now while you're collecting the data. In other words, go ahead and connect your product now because you can make it more convenient for the consumer. So I like to point out, and we ask the question with this technology, this is this Vitality product is the first example, but what happens when you put the reorder button on the razor blade handle? This particular razor blade handle has already got power. It's actually already got a button on it. All it's missing is a $1 radio, and then it can talk to a device like this nightlight and then the razor blades can come in the mail. That changes the distribution model in the same way that Amazon changed the book distribution model. Think about all the layers of cost of distribution that were sucked out of, the, out of book buying and selling in what Amazon has done. Binding, cardboard, paper, printing, trucks, diesel fuel, Barnes and Noble stores, all gone in that model. That's what this model represents. MICA is a very interesting electronic medical record. If you go take a look at the website and take a look at it, the best way I can describe it, it's an EMR, somebody put in a box shipped to Steve Jobs with a note that said, please fix it. And Steve said, sure, and sent it to Facebook along the way back. Doesn't look like any other EMR you've ever seen. Very, very consumer centric. It's really a, consum it's really a customer service uh, management tool, customer relationship management tool. For a, for a medical practice. Focused on primary care, um, it's, it's getting a lot of attention specifically in, in a variety of types of practices, medical call centers, and specifically in kind of concierge-like practices because it lends itself very nice to it here. Why was it so interesting? Why were we interested in seeing this product develop? We were actually the original architects for it at Qualcomm. This is a product that, uh, that integrates all forms of multimedia communication with, between physician and patient. If you instant message your patient, text them, voice call them, video chat with your patient, with, between the patient and physician, and the physician, this, this uh, electronic medical record system logs it, charts it, and transacts it. This is about workflow and the physician workflow. Why is this, was this important to us? Because our industry is working really hard so that this summer you'll start buying new phones that have video conferencing in them. You'll be able to buy them starting, starting around June. First phones will launch. And you'll have video conferencing in your pocket. And so it'll make sense to have it work if it works in the workflow of the average physician, which is why we wanted some examples in the marketplace. We're also to see wireless supplied to diagnostics as a service. This is actually a company that's been around for eight years. It does electrocardiograms 24-7, 365. It's used mainly for making di diagnoses, but Think about what's really going on here. This is a monitored electrocardiogram anywhere, anytime, 365, literally while you're driving down the freeway at 80 miles an hour, you're uh, actually being watched by the, by the uh, tel telemetry center, in, in this case in Philadelphia. This, is, this collects much more data than we've ever had before. What this company proved, if you go back and look at their research, what they proved is, is, that, is that they are 300% more effective at finding the offending arrhythmias than any of the previous whole turn event monitors. Now, the little dirty little secret about it is, is their use case, what they, what they put together, essentially allowed it, made it very easy to monitor people for 10 to 14 days. And they were being monitored, and of course, in and out of their normal lifestyle, and they just were able to catch it longer. Most, most event monitors and uh, whole turn monitors are done for either 24, maybe 48 hours. And, a, and an event monitor requires the consumer to actually understand something's going on and push a button. This does it automatically. This is beat-by-beat beat monitoring, just like a telemetry unit on the floor of a hospital. 
Cardio MEMS is another interesting company. Little tiny MEMS-based sensor placed in the heart, hit with a radio wave to measure pressure for congestive heart failure patients. Very, very inexpensive piece of technology. Not going to be inexpensive in terms of selling it or implanting it, but the technology itself isn't particularly complex. Hitting it with a radio wave gives us the data back to give us the information to help manage titrate drugs, et cetera, in the congestive heart failure space. Microchips is in the implantable, wirelessly controlled drug delivery space. This is an implant that actually delivers drugs through a wireless signal. Proteus, that's a wireless pill. It's in a bag here. This is a company that has come up with some fascinating technology, costs less than a penny, significantly less than a penny to produce, that allows a signal to be generated by the pill once you've swallowed the pill, then to be received by a, ba a small Band-Aid on the outside, and then that Band-Aid can have a more powerful transmitter and, and can get it out to, uh, to the net. This, uh, this technology, some of you may have seen that uh, Novartis just invested $25 million in this company. Uh, this is a technology that looks, shows a lot of promise in drugs that, I, that have a very strong third-party interest in making sure the drug is being taken. Think bipolar drugs, schizophrenia drugs, TB drugs, HIV drugs, somewhere where there maybe is a public health uh, scheme, somewhere where you actually want really strong third-party confirmation. So for a very low cost price point, you can get actual confirmation and you can pick up physiological information because this reports information from inside the stomach. It also times and date stamps the drug. It gives an ID to the drug. It's the first time a drug has actually had a serial number, an electronic serial number. And the Band-Aid itself has additional sensors on it, including relative motion sensors, so you know how active the person's being that's on the drug. You start thinking about what that means for, from a clinical trials perspective. Airstrip is a uh, company that has uh, had an amazing run. In 18 months, they've gone from uh, no sales to over 200 hospitals in America. What Airstrip has done is take on, on doctors' smartphones, they take all the information from the monitors in the hospital, from the maternal fetal monitors and from the uh, ICU monitors and put it on the smartphone. So now when the nurse calls, the nurse isn't just describing what she's seeing. The doctor can look, pull out his phone and see exactly what the nurse is seeing on the monitor. So this, is, this has come very, very rapidly. It's beneficial to the doc whether he's on, the same, on a different part of the same floor or in a different part of the building or already at home or on the way home. This is obviously a point of convenience. What's happening, what's driving their sales is the physicians are actually going to hospital administrators now and saying we have to have this. And of course, whenever that happens, the implied threat is if you don't have it, I'm taking myself and my patients across the street where they do. So this is, this is the beginning of putting more and more information in the hands of the healthcare professionals. So this is part of the convenience factor that is the driver the, on the professional side. ISIS is making essentially disposable IV pumps, wirelessly controlled. These are pumps that have sensors on them, so they collect additional physiological information. They do drug delivery, and you can change the delivery. So think of it, think for example, in the case of pain management, that this is a disposable morphine pump uh, that's wirelessly controlled, and when the physician wants to change the dose, he can do it through the internet as opposed to seeing the patient. Zephyr is uh, it built a series of devices along the chest strap uh, route, which people are familiar with because of Polar and Garmin, etc. But notice, notice the number of additional sensors that are built in. This has uh, gained a lot of uh, traction with the military, but I'll tell you where this, this information is going. It's going in to go to Band-Aids. It's going to be reduced down out of these chest straps over time by a number, by a number of folks. Showed you the uh, known in pulse oximeter. Corventus is uh, done a very interesting patch in the, for the congestive heart failure market. There's eight sensors in this patch. This is a Band-Aid, peel and stick disposable Band-Aid. It's worn on the chest here. Notice what it measures. This is a heart, heart rate, electrocardiogram, fluid status, that's key for congestive heart failure, temperature, respiratory rate, activity <coughs> level, and posture. This knows whether the patient's sitting up, laying down, knows how often they've got set up and laid down. This is meant to be installed in the hospital and the, and the patient be sent home with it. So this is a situation where the patient gets home, sent home with a box of these. And this is about titrating drugs and preventing those readmissions as much as possible and remote, remote monitoring of that patient. 
Wound Technology Network uh, focuses on uh, a home care of wounds, specifically mainly from, caused from diabetes, diabetic neuropathy, and all of the other related things that, that happen with diabetic patients. This is using smartphones, pictures, to manage and care for these patients at home. This happens to be a company that has all of its documentation, all of its care management on phones. So this is a combination of nurses and doctors. They do everything in terms of their care management via smartphones. <coughs> MedApps is an interesting company. That little phone that looks like a cell phone is, it's got a cell phone inside of it, but it's not a cell phone as you think of it. That's a gateway device. That is a, a device that kind of magically connects scales, blood pressure cuffs, pedometers, et cetera, to the net. So it makes it very easy. The consumer doesn't have to do any setup. All of the device management is done from the cloud. And, and that device put in somebody's home means you can send them a scale, say, and have UPS deliver it, and they can take it out of the box, and it will automatically be connected. So this is something that's very uh, interesting to folks from the clinical trial side, as well as some of the disease management companies. BL Healthcare has the same functionality in their device, that same kind of gateway device, but their device also provides video conferencing. So this, this device uh, uses a cellular connection. It can be drop shipped into somebody's home, and that's key. Drop, drop shipping is key in this area, and I'll, I'll explain why here in just a moment, but it's used cellular. The instructions are take it out of the box, plug it in, and it just works. You don't have to do any other setup. Why is that so important? Why can't you use the, the, uh, the, blue, the um, Wi-Fi connection in somebody's house? The reason is there's too many points of failure. They may or may not have a broadband connection. They may not have a Wi-Fi router. They may not have Wi-Fi, the radio may not extend coverage into the room they're going to use your device. They may not know how to add another device and get over their own security. They may not be willing to reestablish security. So companies that have tried using Wi-Fi uh, that we have seen have all failed. They've all come back and they're going using cellular connectivity because they can drop ship into people's homes. When I, I showed you, when I was talking about CardioNet, CardioNet had the first experience here. The way you, when a physician orders a CardioNet uh, system, rather than going down to the basement of a hospital and having a technician install the, uh, the device, the, uh, the FedEx guy brings you the device and you self-install. It's that simple. A couple other quick uh, Connections here. Great Connections, a Swedish company. Very interesting company. This allows the woman to leave the exam table with the video of the, of the baby's ultrasound, the fetal ultrasound, before she gets off the table. All the physician has to do is enter a phone number onto the DICOM screen. The video is transferred. Why is this revolutionary? Well, if the IP holds on this particular company and one of the ultrasound companies gets control of it, the others are out of business, at least as, as, as to OB sales. Very, very popular in Sweden already. It's just come to the, uh, it's just come to the United States, and you can count all the ultrasound companies are, are chasing this company. And I saw it this week as, as the uh, founders of this company were being chased at my conference in San Diego. <laughs> Kelcoms in, China, in uh, Japan. Japan is interesting for this, from this point uh, alone. The Japanese government have, has mandated with fines um, metabolic examinations at age 40 and up. So if you're employed, you have to go through an exam process, it includes weight and um, a chest measurement and a couple of other, other measurements. If you fail according to standardized charts, the company pays a fine and the contribution for that individual goes up to the health trust goes up. So there's now a number of companies serving the employer market to help avoid those fines and increase contributions. That's in a three-year implementation phase. Soterra is one of the most interesting products for the hospital market. I'm showing you the, uh, a, a device that measures temperature, continuous blood pressure without a cuff. That's a revolutionary breakthrough, heart rate, respiratory rate, SpO2 in motion. That's a bigger picture of it. This is worn on the patient's wrist. This is an example of one of the systems that we've seen that's going to go on to hospital patients, just right when you check in. All of these things are now being monitored. If you send the patient down to x-ray, they can be monitored all the way down. This is a Wi-Fi based system. But interesting, it also tells you where the patient is, and the patient can actually call the nurse right from this system. And the nurse can wear one of these devices when the alarm goes off and see which patient it is and what the, what the alarm is, is, uh, is going on. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip through. We're, uh, a, few, a few slides here so will allow some time for questions. But we're trying to solve some of the issues that go with the connectivity and making body area sensors. There's a lot of technical issues here from a radio perspective. 
Uh, that's where Qualcomm comes in. We work with literally hundreds of companies in this space. We find the common issues and we try and so solve those common issues so the companies can, um, can take advantage of that technology to go ahead and deploy their own healthcare solutions. We're working on, it, on gateways, uh, as, as just like the Nightlight Gateway, variety of gateways, so it's very, very simple for medical device companies to put their product on the net. We're working on very tiny modules. I've got one here, it's the size of a nickel. Um, these are, this is everything you need to, put, uh, to make a cell phone. So if you can fit a nickel into your product, you can, your product can be on the cellular network directly. If not, it can have a less expensive radio and then connect to a, uh, a gateway. So these are some of the sm world's smallest modules for connecting wearable devices uh, onto the net. So we like to say con connectivity matters. The world's going from kind of old version to more modern versions to even more modern versions. Of, uh, of connecting folks uh, and measuring uh, uh, vital signs. In this case, I just showed you a series of ECG monitoring patches to a world of numbers where you may actually walk in with your genome to information that goes, the information that flows from the far left to the far right here in, in, uh, in solutions and provides a wide variety of innovative opportunities. So we're moving from an older model of medicine to a newer model of medicine from the obstetrics of yesterday to the obstetrics of tomorrow. That's the GEV scan I talked about. You see a modernization trend here across many different examples, and that's why we call what we're doing of putting everybody on the net. Thank you. Will you take some questions? Sure. Sir? Absolutely. How about some people who haven't asked questions yet? I just wanted to uh, say that my, uh, my wife, who's a nurse, will be absolutely delighted. I wish she'd been here, actually, because <laughs> she would have loved it, because collecting vital signs and inputting data is just an enormous burden. And in fact, her hospital in California uh, just established a new system for inputting patient data and now she spends more hours putting in data into this clunky system which is called EPIC and should be called EPIC fail I think <laughs> but it, it's amazing how the difference in what you're showing here and what I hear her talk about every night and how painful it is to see the clunky way in which hospitals are actually, uh, I was going to say bringing in, it's sort of more imposing kind of technology on people who work in hospitals and how it actually often is um, not Im improving workflow, it's actually inhibiting it. It's, uh, it, it's interesting, the, uh, we're working with multiple companies in this hospital space and several of them have done extensive research with nurses around the world and they basically fall into two camps. Those that say, wow, you're freeing me from a lot of activity, as you just said, that isn't really very productive. Uh, and those that say, you're stealing my job from me. So it's one of the interesting things about adoption that, that uh, the industry is gonna have to overcome. I think obviously, if they can free this time, they'll find very productive ways of putting the time to use. Oh, hi, Don. I, 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 two, two questions, nice to see you again. Um, First question, I guess, is related to reimbursement. Um, one of the big issues is uh, if we go to more remotely located care and care in the home, do we get paid for it? And I know that in the remote monitoring business, this has been an, an issue for some time. The second question, which to me is the more important, is this is all great and wonderful. We're generating lots of data. What do we do with the data? Because, and then the other issue and related to this is we have all these individual companies generating individual bits of data, and in fact, it's our ability to correlate amongst these different uh, data sets, which is what creates the value. And so I think I'd, you can talk to the, the incentive bit for a moment, but what I'm really interested in is who's doing work at the back end that allows us to bring this data together and actually correlate it, what's being done at present, because it's not the hospitals. So we're very uh, aware that, number one, the value is in the data. We also think there's a lot of value in multiple sensor data. Um, and that effectively, over time, will essentially create new vital signs that are combinations of single 
uh, data points in, in the future. Um, that's actually one of the charters at West Institute, is to focus uh, on that area. But on specifically kind of the middleware side of how do you combine data, let me tell you about a couple of, what, a couple of health plans are actually working on right now and a couple of vendors that are come to the table. The health plans recognize that there's lots of point solutions walking in the door. Somebody walks in and says, I've got a better connected scale, I've got a better connected blood pressure cup, I've got a better connected CHF uh, solution. And what some of the healthcare, what I would call some of the more advanced thinking uh, IT groups within the healthcare plans are beginning to say is, what middleware can we install that basically allows us to commoditize the sensor side and choose and mix and match the sensor side and allows us to manage the data and data repository any way we wish to and publish the data to the parties we want to publish it to in the way we want to publish it, not in the way that the solution providers. And there actually are several solutions out. There's, uh, I can point you to one called Vignette, small company, but it's, but it's got great backers with IBM and others. Uh, but these are, that's an example of somebody that's sitting there that's actually built part of that middleware to, uh, to kind of solve that, that problem and essentially take, a, take the point solutions apart and say, listen, we're interested in your sensor and perhaps we're interested in your algorithms, but we're not interested in your end-to-end -end web based but, solution. But, but the middleware is the connectivity piece, is that right? It's not the analytics. Middleware, middleware can, well, when you put that middleware with a company like IBM, you now have both. And that's the point of it. Yeah. So that's, that's the, the companies working on the middleware are teaming up with the analytics companies to provide the, the analytics tools in order to provide that tool. On your, um, your first question, uh, reimbursements, if you're going after a reimbursement market, it's a challenge. That market is different from obviously in the US, say versus Europe versus others. I would say 75% of the, pr of the uh, products we work on, frankly, are not pursuing a reimbursement model. Uh, the, the Soterra product for the hospital, that's a ho hospital cost of doing business model. The, the Vitality uh, pill bottle, that's a pharmacy or PBM or in, the, or in their launch product case, uh, ph pharmaceutical manufacturer reimbursement model. I would say the creative folks are basically saying we're not going to go after CMS unless we absolutely have to and we're going to avoid that model and go a different model. I can think of at least a dozen companies that we just had in town last week that were going after the direct insured uh, models. So they were going after a payer model, but they're going after the self-insured employer. So I think the, the, the idea that you're going to stop and wait for a CMS and a, and a code to come about, I think we're, in, in this particular space, we're seeing lots of people saying, we're not, we're not going to wait for that. We're just going to work around it. Um, so I have two questions. Uh, I was wondering if you've thought briefly at all about encryption for, uh, for your signals or, or who will deal with encryption or if there's a passcode. And uh, my other question is if you digest that pill radio or something else. Uh, this, the pill actually uh, is digestible. The, uh, the actual electronics are actually, the ingredients list is a, comes from a Centrum vitamin bottle. Um, and it's your battery, your stomach acid that forms the battery acid that powers what's not really a radio, it's actually a little electric impulse generator that impulse is then read by the, uh, the Band-Aid. So the, the, the wireless part is the fact that it is tra it's transmitting that electrical impulse through essentially f the fluid in your interstitial cellular uh, body to being received on the Band-Aid. Um, and it's totally biodigestible. Uh, on the encryption side, yes, there's, we, we actually are, a, are one of the world's best encryption providers, but that's not what most of the life science companies ask us for. Uh, we're known for it for little entities like the CIA and the NSA, and when the president picks up a cell phone, it's one we built. Um, but the reality is, is each life science company or medical device company implements its own system. We under, we're very familiar with the HIPAA compliance. We're very familiar with how to create very, very complex end-to-end -end systems, as you might imagine you'd have to be if you were building a phone to be used by the president anywhere in the world. Um, but in reality, when folks come to experts like us on the wireless side, they, are, they have a way that they're going to implement that's going to be HIPAA compliant, security compliant. Sometimes they ask us for advice about how they may, may do it. Um, usually they're adding layers on top of layers. There's really, I mean, frankly, the way the cellular, if you're worried about the cellular signal, that's almost next to impossible to, to break. That's actually one of the strongest links in the system. But even then, most of these companies are putting additional encryption on top of those, uh, on top of those encryptions that's already there. Thank you very much, Don. Wonderful speaker. <laughs>